from MIT. Uh, so it's uh, first time actually we have a PhD student uh, presenting at the workshop. So uh, yeah, no pressure. Uh, right? So it's, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Star has been doing a lot of interesting work at the intersection of programming languages and analog computing. So dealing with like real hardware. All right. Uh, yeah, see so, how real uh, hardware is at the end of this talk. Yeah, that's it. So um, I'm very excited about this line of work and I'm looking forward to it. So please go ahead. Excellent. Thanks for the uh, very gracious introduction, Martin. Uh, so yeah, as you said, I'm Sarah uh, and I work with Martin Reinhardt. We're both at MIT and I'm here to tell you guys a little bit about uh, programming analog devices with the two compilation techniques we developed, uh, John and Arco. And then I will also include a little bit about where I'm hoping this research will go in the future uh, before I graduate. So uh, at a very high level, this talk is about mapping dynamical systems, which are systems of differential equations, onto programmable analog devices, which are this interesting new class of computing platforms. So to recap, uh, dynamical systems are used to model a wide range of physical phenomena in the world today. You can see it, you can see dynamical systems in fields such as electrical engineering, biology, chemistry, acoustics, so on and so forth. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, we will be focusing on dynamical systems that model biological processes. Uh, so what does a biological dynamical system look like? Well, uh, the variables in the dynamical system correspond to physical quantities of the biological system, uh, usually over time. So in this particular system, uh, the variable E corresponds to the enzyme of a reaction, the variable S corresponds to a substrate of the reaction, and then the variable ES, which is a little bit confusing, corresponds to the complex formed from the enzyme and the substrate when they bind. Therefore, uh, the differential equations of the dynamical system specify the continuous dynamics of the state variables over time. In this example, the differential equations characterize the phenomena of the enzyme and the substrate coming together to form an enzyme-substrate complex and then dissociating back into the, uh, the compositional enzyme and substrates. Typically, what we are interested in with these systems is we'd like to simulate the biological dynamical system giving a set, given a set of initial conditions. The evolution of these state variables over time provides insight into the behavior of said system. In this particular example, uh, we can, for example, start off with 6,800 molecules of E and 4,400 molecules of S, or enzyme and substrate, respectively, and zero molecules of the complex, and uh, we call this the initial state of the system. When we simulate the system, um, we obtain the state variable values over time, which we typically interpret in the form of a graph. So all of the graphs in my talk are actually simulation graphs. There are no performance graphs. Uh, people were very, very confused the first time I presented this. They were asking why it was going up and down. Right? Uh, so basically, the way you would interpret these results is you basically look at each of the lines in the line plot. Each of the lines corresponds to a compound in this reaction. So uh, red corresponds to the enzyme here, blue corresponds to the substrate, and green is the complex. So you can see the enzyme and substrate are quickly depleted to form the complex, and then we reach some sort of plateauing area, which we call the steady state. Uh, so there's been a need to simulate dynamical systems for longer than there have been digital computers. So what people used to do in the 1950s is they basically used to use analog computers such as the one pictured on the upper right hand corner. Uh, the way you would use these machines is you would take the variables in your dynamical system and you would map them to currents and voltages in the analog hardware. You would then use a patch base, such as the one uh, you know, listed above, uh, to basically configure the circuit to connect the components together in the circuit so that the physics of your circuit mirror the dynamics of your system. To run your simulation, uh, it's as simple as powering on your circuit and measuring a voltage or a current on one, one of the wires over time. So as you can see in the lower right hand corner, uh, we have this uh, lovely telefunken that has been configured. So you can tell by the, patch, the mess of wires over there uh, to run a car suspension simulation. So uh, what you see on the right-hand side there is uh, the simulation, and they probably what they've done is map the y-axis to voltage, for example. So as we know, uh, there's been once we entered the age of digital computing, uh, analog computers kind of fell out of fashion, fortunately. However, I'm here to tell you guys that um, people have been revisiting analog computation as a potential substrate for simulating dynamical systems again. Uh, these analog devices have basically the same computational model as the analog, analog devices of yore. However, they do use modernized hardware. So instead of using, you know, the, all the old school components, they actually use semiconductor technologies. So the components are built from transistors. And a lot of these devices have new capabilities. Uh, the building blocks you are given are powerful. They're heavily optimized and designed to perform certain computations. These machines are digitally programmable, so you can throw away those patch cords. You can just use an SRAM to program them. And uh, some of these machines are even able to exploit analog noise. So they can generate samples from distribution uh, that are parametrized given some inputs. Uh, so of course, not, all, not everything is good about these systems, and there are some programming challenges with analog devices. Uh, one of the challenges being the physical behavior of the device. Um, the voltages and currents uh, typically only behave as expected over particular ranges, and uh, there's also noise in the circuit, as we're probably all familiar with. 
Uh, furthermore, if you just ignore the physical behavior of the circuit, the building blocks you have are still complicated to work with. They're nonlinear, they're typically non-convex. Uh, and uh, furthermore, since uh, these chips basically get bang for their buck by having complicated components, but relatively small numbers of components and relatively small numbers of available connections, uh, you have to be a little bit creative when you're configuring these devices to be able to simulate your uh, dynamical system uh, given the constraints of the device. So what we need is we need a compiler for programmable analog devices that can automatically compose complex algebraic building blocks and automatically reason about the operating ranges and circuit noise of the system. And for, to, do these, to accomplish these tasks, we need fundamentally new compilation techniques. So here's the outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to go over the uh, inputs and outputs of the compiler because some of them might look a little bit unfamiliar to you. Uh, and then I'm going to go over the ARCO compiler, which is the general approach for uh, mapping dynamical systems onto these analog devices. And then I will go over into the JAUNT, go over, go into the JAUNT solver, which uh, basically automatically scales dynamical systems to execute anal on analog hardware within the operating range constraints. And then finally, I'll go over some closing remarks. I'll go over some of the work I'm working on right now. Um, because ARCO and JAUNT have been published, uh, so I am... Uh, you know, often doing the next great thing with analog computing, um, which I'll touch on briefly. Okay, so a little bit about the compilation problem. So the, what the compiler takes in is it takes a dynamical system specification and it takes a specification of the analog device. We obviously do not want to work with a transistor level representation of the device. And what it does is it produces an analog device configuration. And what this configuration is, is it is a configured version of the analog device specification combined with a set of labels on particular wires uh, where a voltage or current on that wire um, is basically analogous to the variable in your dynamical system. So the dynamical system specification is um, what you would expect. Um, you basically write straight line equations and differential equations, uh, as you would if you used any sort of uh, numerical processing library. And uh, then the compiler also takes in an analog device specification. And this specification might, might look a little bit uh, unusual. So basically what you, what you have here is you, have, uh, you define these uh, block specifications. You define how much of each block you have. So in this particular analog device, we have three Michaelis-Menten blocks, three current adders, five analog to digital converters, and five digital to analog converters. The way you specify a block is you first define all of the input and output ports uh, resident in the block. So in the MM block, for example, uh, we have five input ports. We have X0, Y0, and Z0, and then A and B. And we have three output ports, which are X, Y, and Z. You then also define the relations uh, that govern the behavior of the block. So in this particular block, uh, we have two straight line relations and one differential equation. And uh, you might notice that uh, I don't... I, I, uh, basically have a suffix for a lot of these ports where you have a .i or a .v. And what that indicates, because you don't actually uh, write computation over the ports, you write computation over the, pro the properties of the ports. So the .i indicates the current of a port and .v indicates the voltage of a port. So you can see here uh, we have dependencies between these relations. We have dependencies between the outputs, the relations of the outputs, and we also have a differential equation in there. And so this is called an analog computational component because it takes in analog signals and produces analog signals. We also have components that exist on the digital interface of the device. So we have a digital to analog converters, which take in a digital signal and produce an analog signal. Um, this particular digital to analog converter produces a current uh, where the value of the current um, is equivalent to the digital value that's provided. And then, of course, we have analog to digital converters, which allow for us to read values from the analog device. Uh, where basically, this, this particular um, ADC takes a uh, current of an input, current of, com the current coming into an input port, and turns it into a digital signal. Uh, the specification also allows for you to specify constraints over the connections uh, in the analog device. I'm not going to go too much into that, but you can specify per instance connections or connections over classes of blocks. Uh, yeah, so that about, about, summer, that about covers it for the analog device specification. So uh, next up, the compiler produces an analog device configuration. So if I were to lay out, I'm going to first show you guys graphically what this configuration look like, looks like. So if I were to lay out all of the components available to me in my analog device, the configuration is composed of the set of parameters you want to provide into your circuit, um, where some of these parameters can be time varying if you desire. And uh, you also, the configuration also contains a set of connections between ports, in the, uh, between ports of components in the analog device. And then uh, finally, the analog config device configuration contains labels. Uh, what these labels say is basically, if you were to read the samples from ADC1, the samples over time are, uh, are basically the dynamics of E over time. So they, and they tell you which properties correspond to which variables in your dynamical system. And uh, typically in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to omit all the components that are not in use and only display the components that I'm, that I'm using. So here's an, this is an example of a configured analog device. Of course, I don't actually represent this as a graph internally. Um, basically, it's written as a program. So you have a bunch of set statements that uh, determine what values you're assigning to digital to analog converters, for example. 
uh, you have a set of labels which indicate um, which values and uh, ports your uh, labels, your labels from your dynamical system are mapped to. And then finally, we have the set of conne connections that you're making um, in the circuit. Great. So now that we, under we all understand the inputs and outputs of the compiler, we can go into the actual compiler. So uh, and that brings us to Arco, uh, which was some work from PLDI 16. So the way Arco works is it performs a search over tableaus, uh, by, where a tableau is, might sound familiar to some of you as a data structure that was used in deductive synthesis. Typically, in deductive synthesis problems, it contains goals, assertions, and assignments. Our, our tableau uh, still contains a set of goals, which in this case are going to be a set of mathematical relations we want to, we want to model. Um, it also contains a set of blocks and wires, which are basically analog device primitives that are available to us for the modeling process. Uh, and then finally, we have the configuration and use blocks, which is the state that we're going to build up throughout the search um, that, basically, that eventually will become our configured circuit. So the way Arco works is it starts with an initial tableau, where the initial tableau is the initial state of the search. Uh, so we start off with uh, all of the goals available in your dynamical system. So you basically take all your dynamical system relations and you dump them in your goals column. Uh, and then all of the blocks and wires uh, in the tableau are basically blocks and wires from the analog device specification. So we just dump all the blocks and wires available to us in, this, in the uh, tableau here. And then since we have not done anything yet, um, we have no used blocks and no configuration yet. Arco then derives new tableaus uh, from the initial tableau by using transition rules until it finds a solved tableau. Uh, we know we have hit a solved tableau uh, when we have no more goals left. We may have some blocks and wires left over. Uh, but uh, the used blocks and configurations are completely populated uh, with the blocks that are used during the, in the, by the configuration and the configuration itself. So we should be able to just pull out the configuration from the configuration column and program the chip with it. So I mentioned before that we use transition rules to derive new tableaus. Um, there's three kinds of tradition, transition rules that Arc uses, uh, Arco uses, and that is unification, connection, and variable mapping. Uh, so the first, up, first I'm going to go over here is unification. So basically, the way unification works is it takes a goal and it takes a block. So I'm just going to clear out the space a little bit. So let's say it selects the goal E is equal to 6,800 minus ES and the block MM0. And uh, so we're going to rearrange it a bit. Um, I moved all the goals to the left-hand side. And what we're going to do is we're going to progressively cross off goals that we've solved and add goals as we derive new ones. And what I, I went ahead and did is I put the MM block in the corner and I blew it up. So now you can see all the ports. And then I copied the goal that we're trying to solve right under that block. Uh, just so you guys all get situated here. OK, so the first thing Arco does is it picks a uh, output port um, on the block to map it the relation to. So it's going to try mapping uh, the relation that governs the behavior of x uh, onto, it's going to try mapping e, the behavior that governs e onto x, basically. The way it's going to do that, it's going to make assignments. It's going to look like pattern matching here, but what the system does under the hood is al actually algebraic unification. So it'll rewrite the system algebraically so that it can, it will derive expressions so that when you apply simplifications, algebraic simplifications, you'll be able to get back your orig original goal. Anyway, so you can see here that if you assign x to e, z to es, and x not to 6800, you can make these two expressions equal. So we went ahead and removed the goal, e is equal to 6800 minus es, and we added these three new sub-goals for the assignments. But you see this actually introduces a complexity, because what we've done now is we've assigned es to z, but z has its own set of dynamics. So now what we need to do is we need to unify the dynamics of es with the dynamics of z. Uh, and furthermore, we actually have to unify it with the dynamics of z after we've applied the assignments we already made. So you can see that conveniently, um, if we assign b to 10 to the minus 2, a to 10 to the minus 4, z not to 0, and y to s, we can actually make these two expressions equal. Which leaves, of course, one last complexity, which is that uh, we have to make sure the dynamics of s match the dynamics of y. And you'll see that if we just add an assignment of 4,400 to y not, uh, we are able to now uh, make these two expressions equal. So basically what we've done is we've actually solved the original four goals which are a dynamical system, and we went ahead and added a bunch of goals that are our assignments. Yeah, so these are basically the new set of goals, or the updated set of goals we have to solve. So to recap, you start off with this initial tableau, you remove all the goals you solved during unification, remove the block you just used, add all of the goals that you derived during unification, and you move the block that you used into the use blocks column. The next transition rule is not as complicated, it's just connection. So all you need to do for applying the connection transition is you find a goal of the form uh, one port is equal to another port. And what you do is you look for a wire that connects these two ports. You then remove the wire and the goal and you can add a connection statement to your configuration. Uh, variable mapping is similarly straightforward. You just find a relation of the form uh, some digital interface, some digital input is equal to a value or even a math variable. And uh, you simply remove that goal and you add a set operation. Similarly, if you find a uh, relation where you're assigning an, a uh, variable to an output, 
you add a label operation. So to recap, Arco starts off with an initial tableau and derives new tableaus using transition rules until we have found a solved tableau. The analog configuration in the solved tableau is the configuration that we use to program the chip. And uh, this configuration is algebraically equivalent to the dynamical system, meaning that if you sat there and you derived all the differential equations from the dynamics of the, of the uh, analog hardware, um, you should be able to rewrite that system to get your original dynamical system back. Uh, this technique allows us to be a little bit more creative with how we use the available analog building blocks to model dynamics, while still respecting all the connectivity and block assistance constraints um, that, are in for that are imposed on us. So I'm not going to go over the results in a lot of detail, but I will go over a case study that I, that I found interesting. Yeah. So uh, at some uh, point... Can I ask a question? Sure. What's yeah, up? So do you have a sense of op optimality here? Uh, no. no. So what, this, what, what Arco does is it kind of grinds away and it just generates a ton of configurations. And then I'm actually solving a, doing a lot of the optimality stuff separately. So I'll touch on that in the second section. I mean, also, like, what, do you, what would you mean by optimality here? Like in terms of like smallest number of blocks or... Possibly. I could, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could imagine that you could constrain it so that it tries to use two blocks and then you increase it per periodically. But I think there's more interesting optimization criteria that I'll get to later. Does that answer your question? Great. Okay. So uh, at some point, Arco had to model perk to the negative four. However, there is no exponentiation block on the analog chip. Um, there is the switch block, um, which you can see is not quite an exponentiation block. And, but it, so what Arco did is it found that if it combined a switch block with an adder, uh, where like, so the, the first relation on the top there is basically the combined rel relation of the adder and the switch block together. And it found with these sets of, with, by assigning particular values to each of the inputs, it could render the relation so that when you simplify it using algebra, you're able to derive perk to the minus four. Yeah, so at this point in time, we've solved the problem of algebraically mapping the dynamical system onto analog hardware. However, the, something that Arco does not do is it does not take into consideration the physical limitations of the hardware. That is, it does not take into consideration the operating range constraints of the analog uh, blocks of the hardware, of the analog ports of the hardware, and it also does not take into consideration the sampling rates of the ADCs and the DACs in the hardware. So uh, I'm just going to go, the best way to illustrate this is through a little bit of an example. So we're going to revisit the analog configuration I presented way back in the background section. Uh, so this uh, configuration actually very conveniently simulates the uh, Michaelis-Menten reaction from the very beginning of the talk. So that's the enzyme substrate complex reaction. Uh, so if we observe E, ES, and S over time, we would expect the simulation dynamics to look like this. However, because the blocks have operating ranges, the way you read this is each of the numbers in the red brackets are the minimum and maximum allowable value for each of the ports. Because there's operating ranges, what ends up happening is we end up saturating two of the blocks. So DAC2 and DAC4 here are saturated because we've provided uh, the value 6800 and 4400 to them, but the maximum value they support is 3300. So even though we would like to see the dynamics that I showed you before, what we actually observe is uh, this. And this, by the way, is being very generous. Uh, I am assuming that the, the signals just saturate and that we don't fry the chip. It is entirely possible that you fry the chip in this situation. So obviously you want to avoid it. Uh, so something that might be very tempting to do here is you might be tempted to uniformly scale the analog device configuration. So just multiply everything by some constant scaling factor and then be done with it. However, uh, it's not quite that easy. Uh, this doesn't actually work in practice. And the reason that why this doesn't work is because the scaled signal actually changes the simulation. So you're not actually able to recover the original simulation using this technique uh, in a lot of cases. And that brings us to John. So what John is able to do is it's able to automatically scale the dynamical system so that it can execute on, hard, on analog hardware with the operating range constraints of the hardware taken into consideration. So the way John works, and again, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a high-level uh, overview. Uh, John takes in a configuration that has not been scaled yet. And then it is given a specification, this analog device specification again. This device specification has been augmented to include all of the operating range constraints um, from the hardware. And John produces a scaled analog device configuration. So it basically scales all of your values in a way um, where the uh, scaled configuration is physically realizable, which means all of our signals fall within the port operating ranges, and recoverable, which means we can recover the original simulation at each of the ADCs by performing a simple tran transform. So if we were to visit the configuration we had earlier, a scaled version of this configuration would basically uh, be the same configuration, but with all these scaling factors introduced, algebraic scaling factors introduced. So you can see that there are a bunch of port scaling factors assigned to every single port in the circuit. Uh, and there is also this very peculiar time scaling factor, tau. So because I'm working with time varying differential equations, an interesting property of these differential equations is uh, you can actually scale the parameters in a way where you can change the speed of your simulation.
so basically, uh, our, our simulation speed is also a parameter in this, uh, in this scaling transform. The way you apply the scaling transform is you multiply the parameters by their scaling factors, uh, and then these, these uh, scaled signals propagate through the uh, circuit in a way where it's physically realizable, so all the signals still fall within their port operating ranges. And then finally, uh, you can recover the original simulation by dividing each of your samples by the scaling factor associated with the ADC, and then multiplying hardware time, so you're measuring hardware time as it's elapsing, and uh, you multiply the hardware time by tau, which is, your, which is your simulation speed. So to be a little bit more concrete about this, our objective is to find numerical assignments for scaling factors that produce the fastest simulation, where the scaling factors we have to work with are tau and A1 through A15, and the values that we, have, that we can assign to them are any real numbers greater than zero. And the way we do this is we formulate it as a geometric programming problem, which is a kind of convex optimization problem. So our general problem is going to be taking the device configuration, device configuration and turning it into a geometric program, uh, where the geometric program is going to have the following high-level structure. So we want to maximize tau subject to the four kinds of constraints. And I'm just going to go through each of these constraints and uh, talk a little bit about how you would derive them. I'll give Rob through an example about how you would derive them. So the first kind of constraint we have are uh, factor constraints, which basically ensure that given a block with scaled input signals coming in, we are able to recover the original output signal from the scaled output signal. So if we take the following MM block and uh, we look at the scaled hardware relation that governs this, governs this MM block, so the scaling factors are in blue here and the actual hardware relations in black, um, what we're going to do is we're going to progressively add assertions until we are able to completely remove the scaling expression from the hardware relation. So we're going to separate the blue from the black and add uh, constraints as we go. So you can see that if we, if we assert that A6, A11, A13 is equal to A9, A12, you can actually factor out the scaling expression A6, A11, A13 from the expression underneath the integral. You can then further assert that A6, A11, A13, t tau to the minus 1, is equal to A12. And you can completely factor out the scaling expression from the hardware relation. So if you do this for each of the output ports, what ends up happening is, uh, given a bunch of scaled input signals, you can actually recover your output signal by dividing that output signal by the scaling factor associated with it. So that, those were factor constraints. So next up, we have sampling constraints, which basically assert, uh, assert that given a DAC or an ADC, so a digital to analog converter or an analog to digital converter, we have to ensure that the simulation is actually executed slowly enough for adequate sampling to occur. So the way we do this is uh, we ask the programmer to provide a minimum number of samples they expect per simulation time unit. In this case, it will be two samples per simulation unit. And they're very used to providing this sort of information because you typically have to provide a, a, a time step anyway for differential equation simulation. And what we want to do is we want to assert that the actual number of samples taken per simulation unit by the in the hardware exceeds the minimum number of samples taken uh, re required per simulation unit. So the way we do that is we take the uh, sampling rate for or the number of samples taken per hardware unit for each of the components. Uh, conveniently, all of the samples taken per hardware unit are, is one um, for the ADCs. And what we do is we multiply it by tau to the minus one. So if you think of tau, the simulation speed, as a conversion factor from hardware units to simulation units, the units of tau to the minus one is hardware units over simulation units. So you can see if you apply stoichiometry, you get sample, samples per simulation unit. So, okay. Next up, we have connection constraints, uh, which basically assert that given a connection, uh, we, want, we ensure that the signal is scaled equally on both sides of the connection. So if you have wires, such as uh, the wire connecting DAC1 and A, we have to assert that A1 is equal to A6 because uh, the same scaled signal coming out of the DAC1 that's going into uh, the A port of MM. Then finally, we have operating range constraints, which basically assert that uh, given an input and output port, uh, we ensure that the signal stays within the operating range of the port. So uh, I'm only going to walk through one example here. But basically, um, you do some interval analysis to uh, derive that the signal going into x naught is uh, 6,800 times A7, which is a scaling factor uh, for that particular port. And you just want to assert that it falls within the operating range of that port. Uh, so you, we perform a little bit of magic to, make, to get rid of all the negative values there. But uh, you basically do this for every single port in the circuit. OK, so now that we have our constraint problem, uh, we basically just plug this geometric prog problem into a geometric programming library. Um, we use GPKit. And uh, what the geometric programming library does is it converts it into a convex optimization problem, uh, which then solves for the, uh, the, the minimal or maximal uh, configuration. So in this case, our optimization function is, again, tau, maximizing tau. And what this does is it produces a scaled analog device configuration. So if we run the, uh, the system we've been talking about through uh, the geometric program uh, library, 
uh, we get the following set of scaling factors. So you'll see that there's actually three distinct scaling factors happening here. We have 8.28, which is the scaling factor for A that's passed into A. We have 0.5, which is the scaling factor that's passed into B. And then everything else is scaled by 0.06. And the simulation speed is scaled by 0.5, meaning we're running the simulation twice as slow. Uh, yeah, so I'm all, again, I'm not going to go over uh, results in a lot of detail, although again, if you guys are curious, we can get into the nitty gritty. Um, I will go through a quick case study. Uh, so basically we have this, uh, we have one of our benchmarks, this replicator benchmark, which uh, is a gene network that generates oscillations. So you can think of it as a genetic clock, but in the genome. And uh, typically what you're interested in observing uh, with these synthetic genetic clocks is you want to see this oscillatory behavior. Uh, so if you try to simulate this system uh, using an unscaled configuration, so you decided not to use Jaunt, what ends up happening is uh, the system actually saturates and you lose your oscillations. And what's more worrying here is um, not only does it saturate, but it saturates in a way where it's not immediately clear where the problem is because the, uh, analog, the analog chip does support a much higher value than 150, which means that there's some sort of internal, saturating hap internal saturation happening in the circuit, which would be very difficult to debug. If you use Jaunt, um, to produce a scale configuration, you're able to run the simulation three times faster than the unscaled configuration. And uh, I know, so that's basically before you apply the recovery transform. Uh, so it looks a little bit funky, but you'll see that you run it in about 300 uh, hardware units as opposed to 1,000, which is how long it would take if you didn't do any time scaling. And uh, if you apply the recovery transform, you recover your original simulation. Okay. That was really fast. So uh, I guess like I'm going to go over a little, go over some of the future directions of this work. Um, so I'm going to go through a little few closing remarks. Um, so what's next for me? Uh, well, I, my, my life has been tracking down hardware. So recently we entered a collaboration with Sendine over the summer. Uh, they're an analog device manufacturer and they are working on a prototype uh, of an analog computing chip that they're hoping to release at some point soon. Uh, so they gave me, I found a bunch of NDAs and they gave me a prototype of their chip. Uh, so I've been kind of playing with it, uh, trying to get a feel for uh, how it works and also building up the infrastructure for this chip because unsurprisingly, uh, given that it's designed by electrical engineers, there isn't a whole lot of uh, software for working with it. I mean, this is like a little bit of an anecdote. Uh, I, I, needed to give a, I needed to provide a signal to this chip and uh, they, were, they were like, oh, well, you just build the circuit and they sent me the schematic and I had to go buy the parts and learn how to build a circuit. Was my, I've, very quickly becoming a hardware, hardware person, unfortunately. I'm getting rid of all the abstractions. Uh, so anyway, while I was building up the infrastructure for this chip and doing some uh, measurements and playing around uh, with, the, with the space, I stumbled upon what I think is a pretty interesting problem. So uh, let's say I want to double an input current X. Uh, here are four candidate circuits for doubling an input current, and I'm going to explain them from left to right. So the circuit on the far left is a current mirror doubler. So basically what you do is you provide it with an input current, and this current mirror duplicates the input current. And uh, because of Kirchhoff's law, if you join the two outputs, um, you'll end up summing the two currents. So you can double X this way. You can also use the constant gain amplifier. So uh, you basically put it, put it through an amplifier where it will uh, amplify by a factor of two. That's another way you can double X. You can use a current multiplier and supply one of the inputs as a DC signal of a value of two. Also doubles X. And then the last one is uh, you can use a clockless DAC in conjunction, in conjunction with a lookup table and a clockless ADC. And uh, you can basically encode the two times X operation in the lookup table. Uh, so I guess the question I want to pose is, are these all the same? And uh, since it's a rhetorical question, I'm not going to actually wait for a response. Um, the answer is they're not the same uh, because they have different noise behavior. And in more, uh, more specifically, from left to right, uh, we have low noise to high noise circuits. Uh, so the first, the first thing uh, I want to address is, uh, is this a bad thing? Do I have a thesis or should I go and like change my topic, my sixth year? Uh, and uh, the answer is I don't actually think it's as bad as you would think. Um, a lot of systems actually have inherent stochastic behavior. And in those systems, this can potentially be an asset. For example, like there's stochastic processes, stochastic differential equations. So if I can somehow coerce noise to match the stochastic behavior of my system, then I've, what I've achieved is a more accurate simulation or an accurate stochastic simulation. Even in systems that don't expose noise as a first order contract, there is inherent uncertainty in physical system models. So as long as I manage to make the noise less than the uncertainty in the model, it might still be okay. So I guess the big question is, here is, what can we do to manipulate noise in the circuit to fulfill these goals? Or am I just stuck with noise I'm given with and uh, I don't have a project here? So uh, I, at least based on my tinkering, I believe there are three, uh, at least three ways that you can uh, kind of manipulate these circuits to uh, get the noise characteristics that you want. The first thing, you can re rearrange the circuit to reduce noise. So, okay, in, th in these figures, obviously, I, I mean, I just got the oscilloscope working, so I don't have any actual empirical numbers yet. This is an artist's rendition. 
of uh, the noise and signal in a circuit. So like basically the blue is the signal and these little graphs and the, uh, r and the uh, orange is the uh, noise characteristics. So for example, if you know that the current multiplier is a high noise component and generates a lot of noise, uh, you can either do multiplication before putting it through a current mirror, in which case uh, you've introduced a lot of noise and then you've went ahead and amplified it with your signal, or you can use a current mirror to double your lowest dynamic range signal, and then you can put the, the boosted signal uh, and Y through the amplifier, through a current multiplier to generate the term that you're interested in. So these two circuits, of course, both compute two times X times Y. The second thing you can do is you can increase the dynamic range of X by introducing a scaling factor. So basically you can introduce this A1 and uh, you basically ramp up the signal and uh, you can undo the scaling factor afterward, uh, provided this is the only thing you're computing in your circuit. And then the third technique, which I think is pretty interesting, is uh, if you know something about the frequency characteristics of your system, you can insert a filter that removes noise. So basically, if I know that my signal X is band limited by omega, uh, and I know that the current, measure the current mirror generates a lot of high frequency noise, I can insert a low pass filter after the current mirror, and I can cut off the high frequency noise and improve the SNR that way. At least uh, that's what I, I think I'm hoping I can do. Uh, I've done a couple, like, back, like, a couple experiments to... Uh, see if this works, and it seems to work at least in simulation, so we're going to try it on the hardware soon. Uh, so I guess what I'm getting at here is um, I would like to see if we can mechanize these optimizations instead of relying on intuition, which is typically what these electrical engineering guys do. Uh, and that's what I'm looking to do with Legno. So Legno should be able to perform noise-aware scaling transforms uh, and filter generation. So basically given a circuit, it'll find a way to scale everything uh, and insert filters so that the noise characteristics of our system uh, mirror the noise characteristics of our target dynamical system. And then I would also be interested in having it be able to rank configurations based on how closely the, con the resulting simulation would be to the simulation we aim to target. So Legno would instead of, uh, instead of taking differential equations, Legno will take stochastic differential equations. And instead of taking just an analog device specification, it will take a specification and a noise model. And then finally, uh, Legno will ge generate a configuration in a way where um, it is con conscious of the noise characteristics of both the stochastic differential equations and the analog device specification. Thank you. OK, thanks, Sarah, for the great talk. So any questions? Okay, we'll go like this. Hello. Uh, from your description of the compiler, it wasn't clear to me that this is deterministic. I could have chosen another equation and I would have had another, I don't know, is there some backtrack involved there? So or? each of the paths um, in the search process would be a different unification step. I mean, algebraic unification is also non-deterministic. There's a whole myriad of ways you can rewrite your system, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I can't, I can't say that it completely explores every avenue, but I will say that it's bounded because you have a finite number of components and connections. Got it. That means if I, if I rewrite the order of the equations, I might get another solution. If you rewrite the order of the equations, you might get another solution. So the equations are actually handled in parallel, and the actual routing process between equations is handled separately. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank Hi. you very much for the talk. Um, so, in the process you described, you already got the the properties right of the analog device. So you already know what it looks like. You know the design. My mm -hmm. question is, can you do it the other way around? So, say, given a simulation, you get a particular um, equation system, and you want to know what type of device could be. Uh, could be good for that. I mean, not just from the perspective of, uh, say, just analyzing the simulation and, well, A, just saying, is the device, I mean, is it even feasible? Or would that be good? Maybe there are certain characteristics that would do better maybe on some other type of device using some type of other, so. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's a lot more d difficult. I mean, you, you could do that, but the thing is a hardware, an analog hardware guy will have to implement the blocks that you come up with on the transistor level. And there's a lot of black magic that goes on there to actually make it efficient and make it have all the properties uh, that you would want. I mean, you could do that for, to maybe inform the design process and let them know what components might be interesting uh, for them to include in an accelerator. But I think as far as generating the actual hardware, that'd be very difficult. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello. Hi. So, from what I understood in your talk, you first have your compiler and then run either Chant or Legno to find the scaling factor so that it runs fast and fulfills the scaling properties. Mm -hmm. Now, 
have you looked into jointly running them so that you produce the configuration that runs the fastest, in, including ser like the search of the topology and the scaling factors? Yeah, so actually, uh, so Legno is not implemented yet. I'm still playing around with the ideas. But John uh, is actually integrated into the search process. So one of the features of John that I don't go into because it's confusing is you can evaluate it on partial circuits too. So you can have like a partially configured device, and you can, for, and you can, for example, eliminate something. You can eliminate a search path prematurely based on its like whether it's feasible even to pursue that search process. And of course, you can use uh, your ability to scale time, for example, as a way of ranking different search paths. So yeah, I've looked into that, but it, it's easy to think of it conceptually as separate problems um, so that you can work at you can work on uh, the optimization problem separately. But yeah, they're actually integrated in practice. Yeah. Coming back to the earlier question. Is there now a notion of optimality, or is it just heuristic in the in the runtime? Like yeah. So um, the cert, like we're not going to be able to say for sure that we have found the optimal configuration, uh, unless we do exhaust. In, in, well, even then, I think it would be difficult. I mean, combinatorially, I guess you could, you know, iter, iter, enumerate all of the configurations, but that space is is huge. Uh, so yeah, for now, I mean, you just let it run and uh, generates a bunch of configurations, and then. Thanks. Can start from there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello. Um, are there any uh, real-world dynamical systems that cannot be mapped to the analog device that you were working with? Sure. Uh, Non-separable PDEs. So if you have a PDE that you cannot decompose into ODEs, mm -hmm. uh, you, you would have a hard time simulating it. Because the, the way you do integration in the analog, cir in analog circuits typically, at least in the devices I've looked at, is you use a capacitor, right? And that integrates Conver over time. And conversely, is there an exact description of the space of systems that can be simulated? Uh, I think, I mean, we're working on teasing that out. I mean, I don't, I, 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 that'd be an interesting thing to look at, I think. But I don't have like a good answer for uh, what exactly are the kinds of systems it can simulate. One more question. To the front, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of guarantee uh, that the programmer gets on how precise the, the results are? Like if I was interested in that oscillating system and, and mm -hmm. measuring the frequency of the oscillation. Um, can you get a guarantee from that? Yeah. How, how, how much can I trust that number that comes out of this system? Yeah. So uh, noise is some, something that's inherent in analog systems. Uh, which is why I'm, I'm moving to stochastic differential equations, which was always the plan, because the, our collaborators do use it for stochastic computation. So uh, I guess the idea is you would want to match the casting behavior there. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe you could, I mean, if there's some sort of, you'd have to specify some sort of like tolerance for the amount of error you're willing to, or not error, but amount of variation you're willing to accrue for your state variables, and you compute them. So, Sarah, how complex are the configurations? Could you? Uh, how complicated are the configurations? Yeah, compl yeah. I think I have a slide on that. Okay. Let's see. Just yeah, so I think the largest set of differential equations I ran it on was apoptosis, which is uh, 27 differential equations, 48 functions, and uh, 87 parameters. And uh, do I have the component breakdown? I don't, I don't think I do, actually. Um, but it's able to handle, like, I mean, tens to hundreds of components. I mean, at this point, the baseline I have to beat is an electrical engineer sitting there configuring the netlist by hand, right? So any sort of automation is good, because at this, like, I had to read this guy's thesis, right? And I would say a quarter of his thesis was the hardware, and then three quarters of his thesis was programming it. So, thank you. yeah. Okay, so let's uh, thank Sarah again. <clears throat>